everyone. Uh, welcome to this episode of Tying with the Pros with deer hair guru, Pat Cohen. Pat is the owner of RU Superfly. Uh, he's well known for his deer hair work uh, as one of the best in our craft. Also the author of Super Bass Flies. If you haven't seen his book, definitely check it out. You can learn a ton in there. I know I have. Uh, with that, Pat, thank you for being here. Uh, what are you going to tie with us today? Well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to tie an articulated deer hair diver. It's a, kind of a takeoff of uh, what Larry Dahlberg had created with his Dahlberg diver. This particular version is gonna have two hooks, an articulation point, uh, one of my creature tails um, to make it look like a, an injured or wounded minnow. So it's gonna be kind of fun. Awesome. And what, what are you tying on? What kind of hook do you have there? So this is a size two. It's a, an A-Rex TP610. Uh, we're going to start off with that. That's our tail hook. Our tail hook is always going to be much, much smaller than the upfront hook. So what I'm doing here is this is a creature minnow tail. This is the small tail. I'm just going to attach this right to the top of the hook shank. It's going to be laid out as if the minnow was laying on top of the surface on its side. So we're just going to secure that. I'm using 210 denier flat wax nylon to start everything. And I'm just going to use a little bit of zap a gap and make sure that that's good and secure on there. And then what I'm going to do is take a little bit of, this is chocolate's filler flash. And I'm just gonna use a little bit of orange and I'm gonna build up a little tiny bit of bulk because we're gonna put some Palmer Schlappen feathers in front of this. And I want those feathers to kind of stand out a little bit without creating a ton of bulk. And what this filler flash does is it kind of creates a pillow for that schlop and to lay on since this material is a little bit stiffer and it'll help hold it out a little bit. Just a few wraps, we don't need a lot. And then I'm just gonna secure that down and we'll trim off the excess. make a couple more wraps on there make sure it's nice and tight and again we're going to hit that with a little bit of zap a gap i like making really durable flies so i tend to use a fair amount of glue as i'm tying and knots all of the above but so this is just a schlopping feather this is a yellow one i'm grabbing it by the tip of the feather and i'm just going to brush those fibers back. And we're going to secure that. And I'm also grabbing a grizzly. And we're going to do the same thing. Do you have a preference? Do you have a preference for what kind of schlopping you're using for those? Is it strung schlopping? Yeah, it's just strung, uh, strung schlopping, nothing fancy. I use, for the most part, all basic materials that you can get. I don't go too exotic with most stuff. All right, so I've got my two feathers. And now I'm just gonna use my middle finger to support those feathers and keep, keep them exactly where I want them on the hook shank. And I'm just gonna palm her forward and create a little bit of a body. That's it, just like that. And then we're gonna tie that off. and trim off the excess. Now we're just gonna make a nice thread head. Whip finish that. And again, a little bit of zap a gap over top of those thread wraps. We'll make sure that it never comes undone. And that's it, that's our tail. Super simple. You can do the same exact thing if we weren't making a bass bug with it. You could do this 
as a tail of an articulated streamer also, and it would work pretty much the same way. I don't put any weight on the tail because I want this to freely swing around and move as I'm stripping the fly through the water. So now what we're gonna do, this is just a piece of um, braided stainless wire that's coated. It's uh, 45 pound. First things first, before I even string that through the eye, I cut these little squares of foam. So when I'm working on articulated flies, I stick that piece of foam over my hook point. That way when this thing's swinging around and I'm working on the front of the fly, I don't put it through my thumb. But how do you add the secret ingredient to all your flies if you're not bleeding all over them? <laughs> Berkeley power bait? No, no. <laughs> all right, so we're gonna fold that wire over and I'm just gonna put a bead on it. And now I'm just gonna set this aside for right now. So now I'm gonna grab, this is a size one, same hook, ARAX TP610. So this fly is keel weighted. So what I'm gonna do, this is a 3 16th, eh, you can kind of see it, a 3 16th tungsten bead. And I'm just gonna put that on my hook. Now, I'm not tying weed guards on this. I'm mainly a river angler. So I don't, I don't necessarily need a lot of weed guards on these flies. Um, this particular one, because I'm using it to imitate an injured minnow as opposed to like a frog or a mouse or something that would start on the banks, anything like that, any frogs, anything like that, I put weed guards, I put double weed guards on all of them. I like to, to cast those flies to a bank um, or on top of lily pads or whatever, and I strip them through all sorts of sloppy nastiness. Uh, when I'm doing a minnow or an injured minnow fly, I don't need that because minnows obviously already start in the water. So I'm not concerned about getting this snagged up on too much. So now what I'm doing, I'm going to, we have to secure this bead below the hook shank on the bend of the hook. That way all the weight is on the belly. So this will land accurate every time it will land guaranteed belly side down. So what I do is run a little bit of thread on that. And then I'm just taking a little piece of mono. This happens to be 80 pound. And I'm going to put a little tiny piece of this mono secured to the hook. I'm just going to go on the back side of the bend. And what that's going to do is these beads have a bevel and it's going to catch in that bevel and it's gonna hold that bead exactly where I want it in place on, on this shank. So we're just gonna tie that off. And again, I'm gonna put a little bit of zap -a gap over all that just to make sure nothing slides. And then- I wanna add just one piece real quick, Pat, too. Uh, in addition to keeling, uh, making sure that it flies you know, right side up or swims right side up, uh, that bead will also impact the swimming action, right? It will. Yeah, it's going to. Um, well, it's going to keep the it's going to keep the fly steady, and it's also going to make it a whole lot more easy for me to get it to go down below the surface. These type of flies, I like to fish these on intermediate sink lines or even full sink lines for that matter. And then I constantly mess with my leader length until I get the fly to dive and shoot and do whatever it is that I'm looking to get it to do at that particular time. So you can kind of mess with all of that stuff and it changes uh, it changes the scenario quite a bit. And do you, I assume you constantly mess with little tweaks here and there. And I know I do and a number of the guys we tie do. Oh yeah, always. I mean, you can get a fly to behave however you want it to if you, you know, change enough things after a while. I, I've learned a lot over the years. I mean, not only just playing with flies, but, you know, we, we try to get, we try to get flies to imitate lures. We try to get lures to imitate flies, jigs, the whole nine yards. So by, by looking at things like swim baits and glide baits and jerk baits and all these other things from the tackle industry, you can start to figure out how to make flies do things also when you put weight in various places. So, all right, what I'm doing now 
is I'm going to, I ran a thread base. Now this goes against everything else that I've ever showed anybody with deer hair. Because normally I do little tiny bits of thread base at a time, we pack the hair back and then we just keep moving forward. This time, because I'm doing an articulated fly, I ran an entire thread base all the way down this. So I'm just gonna secure one end of the wire and I'm not gonna get too crazy with my thread wraps on it yet. I just don't want it to move around on me. And now we're gonna do the other one. So you're securing, I mean, a good portion of the hook shank that wire to it. That's not just like a quarter, half inch. How, how, how much do you like to secure those? I, I'm all the way to the eye of the hook. And I do that because I never, ever, ever, ever want the articulation point to pull out. And then you fold it back, I assume? I fold it back and then tie back down over top of it. Now I'm gonna really thicken up my thread base on this. And then what we're gonna do is glue the whole thing. And then I'm gonna go back, we're gonna switch threads and I'm gonna go over it with GSP and we're gonna do it all over again. I'm gonna secure it back down and build another thread base with the GSP. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow us to slide that hair wherever it is that I want it to go so we can pack it back. GSP is very slippery. So I just glued all that. Now I'm going to start at the eye of the hook with my GSP. And I'm going to go back over all that thread base that we just laid down. Now I'm using 200 denier GSP. So in essence, the base you're putting down with the GSP is to act like the bare shank when you're packing. Yeah, more or less. What, so what we've got here, because there's so much thread and we've got some glue in there also, um, and you've got the wire, which has that coating, which also kind of squishes down. So the, the thread will compress that wire sheath, the, the wire casing, and it will, it will make sure that that holds in place. And then all of this thread base, what we've done basically is built kind of a, kind of a cushion almost for the deer hair so that when we, we start putting the hair on and we start really compressing this thread, it, it bites into that and it makes sure that that hair will go nowhere. It's no different than when I'm, when I'm normally working on a bass bug, I only do a little section of thread base at a time, but I do a fair amount of thread base. It's all crisscross wraps. And then we pack that thread base back. And when we pack that back, we're packing the hair and the, and the hair, uh, uh, the hair and the uh, thread at the same time. All that thread kind of clumps together and it gives something for that hair to bite onto, as opposed to a bare shank where Basically, one or two fish later, you know, your, your bass bug is going to be twisted all over the place. This just helps secure everything, if that makes sense. Trying to make sense out of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes sense to me. You know, I've tied with some deer hair, um, you know, not from before your book and from some of your old DVDs and stuff. Uh, cool. But uh, for people who haven't tied with deer hair, I think that's a really helpful explanation. All right. So what we're doing now is I'm just going to put Again, a little bit of that filler flash. I'm using a pearl at the very back of the hook shank, as far back as I can get right up against those beads. Is this and for I the just, same purpose? Are you trying yep. to support schlopping again? Okay. I'm not going to use schlopping this time, but yeah, I'm just trying to build kind of a, a support system. So just a few wraps of that, just enough to make sure that uh, it'll help keep that material that I'm going to put next away from the bend of the hook or uh, away from the hook point. There's nothing worse than having all of your material wrap around your fly and, and kind of change the motion of the fly because your stuff's not, uh, you know, your material's all tangled. All right, so this time, since we've got a little bit more room now, I wanted a taper more or less. So we went with shorter materials in the back. I'm gonna go with a little bit longer. So we're using Marabou now. 
and it's going to kind of, I don't know, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it. it, it it's just going to kind of envelop around that tail. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm going to tip tie it and we're going to palmer it, but we're not going to go very far up with it. So let me get my thread out of the way. And we don't need a lot. This just creates a little bit of extra movement in the fly and a little bit of extra body. Do you ever use anything aside from marabou in this step? I mean, I've used synthetics. I've used all sorts of different stuff, yeah. You can pretty much use whatever, I mean, that's the cool thing about tying flies is, you know, a lot of materials, once you, once you understand the characteristics of each individual material, whether it's natural or synthetic, you can, you can basically, you know, substitute whatever material you want. You could use bucktail, you know, a, a marabou doesn't hold up well against things like pike. Um, so I tend to use more bucktail on on stuff like that or uh, or synthetics. I use a lot of synthetics, I like synthetic materials. They're always consistent. OK, so you can see what we've got here now. You've got your little bit of schlopping back here, just kind of around that tail. We don't want too much stuff around the tail itself because we want that that creature tail to move. And now you've got almost a wing of marabou coming over that. And that's gonna pulse in the water as we're stripping. Now we're on to deer hair. So I'm just gonna put a little bit more glue over that marabou tie-in. And then... Hey, and Pat, if you get a sec, the next time you adjust that tail out the back, I'd like to point out, if you notice the taper from that marabou to the schlop into the tail, um, it's kind of a recurring theme anytime we like to tie bait fish patterns is working on kind of that natural bait fish profile. And it's not something that just happens by accident. It's something that, you know, we think through and try to do on purpose. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to have, you've got to have that taper. And uh, along with that, you can't taper without a support system, which is why we're using the, the filler flash in between that will really, um, it, it gives, it gives a base for all the softer materials mm -hmm. uh, to hold on to. Okay, so now we're gonna switch over to our deer hair. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna get too, too crazy as far as a million different blends of colors and things like that. Um, we're making basically a perch pattern. So it's going to be uh, fairly simple. It's gonna be a white belly. And then we'll do a little bit of orange up towards the throat, uh, yellow, olive and uh, some black bars. So what I'm doing is I cut a chunk, about three pencil thicknesses, give or take, worth of white belly hair. I hold it by the tips and I use my other hand and I'm just gonna brush out all the under fur, all the fuzzy stuff, all the short fibers. If you don't wanna do it with your hands, the other thing that you can do is pick up a cheap flea comb at Walmart or your pet store or whatever, and you can brush all this out. The reason that you don't want that under fur in there, it will, it will catch, the thread will catch on it. You'll fold over your hair, you'll end up with a mess. And it's just, uh, it's a whole lot easier just to get that right out of there. So what we're doing here is we're stacking, not spinning. So stacking, what we're gonna do is I bring my hand in front of my vise and I hold that entire clump of hair at a 45 degree angle running back towards me. So the butt ends of the hair are facing towards me. I'm gonna take two loose wraps with my thread. I'm just gonna move my hand out of the way so you can see what I do. On my third wrap, I'm gonna walk that entire bundle of white hair to the bottom of the hook shank. And now I'm gonna compress straight down. And what that's gonna do is flare my hair out, completely covering the belly of the hook. Now we can build up from there. The thing to keep in mind is you want equal amounts or just about equal amounts, top to bottom uh, density of hair. If you're going to get 
more dense in the bottom or the top, you're always going to want to add a little bit more density to the top side, not the bottom side. That will make sure that your hair is nice and tight and your fly floats pretty consistent. That's part of, and, and just as an aside real quick, you mentioned using GSP just for a slick base again, but you're also using GSP because of the amount of force and tension that you're putting on that thread when you're, when you're compressing the hair, right? When you tighten it all. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, any other thread would snap uh, pretty easily, actually, if we, uh, if we tried to compress deer hair with it. You're trying to get your thread as close to that hook shank as possible without cutting through your hair. Inevitably, you're going to cut some hair at some point. I mean, it's just going to happen. I still do it. And, you know, I've been tying bass bugs for 12 years, 11 years, 12 years, something like that. And I, and I still cut, I still cut my hair. Again. Especially the really hollow stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, and, and when the, when the hair is processed, they bleach it. Uh, and then they dye it and whatever. But that bleaching process weakens the fibers a lot. It weakens the hairs. So sometimes you get you get a piece that was overworked. It was overcooked. It might be burnt a little bit. And you don't know it until you go to use it. And then all of a sudden you put a little bit of tension and poof, it just, you know, you cut through and it explodes. But then, you know, next time you use a little bit less tension. All right. So now if we use three pencil thicknesses worth of white on the bottom, we need to use three pencil thicknesses worth of whatever color we're going next with. And I'm gonna go with yellow. So I'm going to do about one and a half pencil thicknesses. And we're gonna lay that right on top of the hook shank. I'm gonna bring two wraps through. I'm gonna pinch it. And then we're gonna compress down. And now I'm going to do a little black bar. So maybe half a pencil thickness worth of black. And again, make sure you're brushing out all that under fiber and all the short hairs. Now, an important thing when you're tying bass bugs, you never, ever, ever want your thread to migrate. What that means is while you're making your stacks, that thread has to go back through the same exact place in that hair every single time you add more hair. If you shift it, you're gonna end up with flat spots and you'll cut your thread when we're trimming out. And then you waste an hour of your life and you have to start all over again. <laughs> that just sucks. Which will, which is unavoidable at some level, but we're oh, trying yeah. to avoid. <laughs> it's, I mean, it happens to all of us. So now I'm adding my olive and again, two wraps, and then I compress my thread straight down. And now I'm going to do one more little black bar on top of that. Now I use my scissors and I separate tips and butts on the hair that I put on on top. That way I know I'm getting everything dead center every single time. Now we're going to do something just a little bit fancy. I want I want some red gills showing on this. But like I said before, we're making this look like a minnow that's laying on its side on top of the water. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna flip this fly over and I'm gonna put a little red dot on the belly. There's two ways that we can do this. I can just lay it in like this and wrap my thread through like we've been doing. Or if you're worried about controlling it, you can actually take the hair and fold it over your thread and then use your thread to pull that hair into place. And then you don't have to worry about it migrating. I'm just gonna lay it in there. I don't mind if it's a little sloppy for this. Neither do the fish. No, they don't. We care way more than the fish do most of the time. But that's what makes all this fun. Exactly. All right, so that's done. I put one more wrap through and that kind of secures everything. Now I'm just gonna use my fingers. I'm gonna brush that back. Got my packer here. I'm going to get on top of the thread base. I'm gonna support the back of the hook. 
and I'm gonna compress that hair back as far as I can get it to go. Now what's creating pressure against us is those beads that we put on on the back of the fly. Otherwise all this hair would just fall right down the, the bend of the hook and this would just not work. And really quickly, before we get too far ahead here, um, I'm holding here, this is kind of an old school plastic packer, right? Like it, you just put it over the hook shank and you push it on. That yep. was all that was available um, until Pat figured out that there was a better way. Uh, and he created the fugly packer. Um, if you do any sort of deer hair work, um, they're essential. They've got a little notch in the teeth there that go around the hook shank. When you compress everything, it really is the only way to get the type of compression that you're going for. Yeah, I mean, even the, the little brassies that were out years ago, like they would bend out. I mean, if you were putting a lot of pressure on the fly or on the on the hair, you would bend them, end up with hooks in your thumbs. And I mean, I, I can't tell you how many hooks I ended up in my fingers before I said, OK, there's got to be something that I can do that would make this a little bit better. So now what we're going to do, that same kind of process all over again, I'm going to go back to my white. This time I'm gonna cut the tips off. Now, the reason I left the tips on the first stack is because we're gonna have a collar in the back. So those nice tapered tips are gonna go over top of that marabou. Once again, we're creating a support system. So we've got the flash under the marabou, you've got the marabou, and then you've got the tips of the deer hair. And hopefully the theory is that that'll hold some of that marabou down so that it stays in place and doesn't wrap around the fly. Now with the body sections, the tips will actually just get in the way. That's why I cut them off. The other thing is deer hair is tapered. So your tips are much, much less diameter than the butt ends, which is the close end of the hide. So if you cut those tapered tips off, you end up with hair that's a little bit more consistent density all the way through. So again, two wraps. And we're going to walk that white down to the belly, compress it, and I'm just going to put a little bit of head cement. Is that the uh, water-based stuff? Yeah. Yep, yep. It's uh, just the loon water base. Have you noticed any uh, any lack of adhesion? Do you feel like that works just as well as like you know traditional like hardest hole or something like that? Absolutely. Yeah, I've had no problems with it. I've been using this stuff for years. The other, I mean, here's the thing with glues. Glues will not make up for bad tying. So no matter what, you need to make sure that you're tying the fly properly. Glues will help. They'll help add durability, but they will not make up for crappy technique. All right, so again, we're gonna do a little black. And then some olive. When you cut the tips off, about how long would you say the clump is from uh, base to butt once you cut the tips off? This hair that I'm using here is probably a little over an inch when I cut the tips off. Yeah, I would say just a little over an inch. You don't need a ton of hair. I mean, some people when, they, all right, so length of hair is a, is a funny thing. I hear people complain about the hair length all the time. And the thing is, it's easier, of course, to work with longer hair. I mean, that goes without, without saying. But you can still make a good bass bug with short hair. Because don't forget, you're trimming most of that longer hair off anyway on the final, you know, the final design of the fly. So it really, I don't know. I, I mean, people get crazy about it. I need three inch long hair from, you know, whatever. Well, man. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, 
it just doesn't exist. I mean, this is a natural material. You've got to learn. You have to learn to work with what you're given. And, uh, you know, that's just not something that uh, is out there that often. I mean, you try to get the best hair, you know, the best quality hair that you can. Okay, so wait, I'll get back to that in a minute. So what I'm doing here is I cut a chunk of white, I cut the tips off, and I'm just going to lay it down for a minute. And now I'm going to grab just a little tiny bit of orange. I'm going to cut the tips off of that. Now, I'm just going to grab a little bit more white. Okay, so now I put the whole clump in the palm of my hand. I think you can see that. And I'm just gonna rough it all up. And then just like shuffling a deck of cards, I'm gonna grab some, throw it on top and keep doing that. I use my thumb to hold whatever hair down and then I grab the rest of it out and I'm just gonna keep shuffling until I get the desired blend that I'm going for. Now, I like for this, it's gonna be kind of, even, evenly blended all the way through. If I was doing something where I wanted more of a mottled look, I may not blend it nearly as much. I may leave clumps of hair, you know, different color hair in different areas. So once we do that, I'm gonna get this on the bottom of the hook also. It's not holding, oh, there we go. And for anyone who can't see what Pat's doing right there, um, when he's putting his finger on that side of the clump, he's keeping contact with the tip of his finger to the shank so that that hair can't fill that space so that there's space for the top clump. Yes. That is exactly what I'm doing. All right. Now, I don't want to do all the bars on this last little bit. So what we're going to do is I'm gonna take a clump of yellow. Perch don't have up towards their head, they don't have the bars anyway. It's more of a kind of olivey yellow blend. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take olive and we're gonna take yellow. And I'm gonna do the same thing that I just did with the white and orange. And I'm just gonna blend that in my hand. So it's nice and even. And then we're gonna put that right on top of the hook shank. Cannot believe how fast you just blended that. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a lot of them. <laughs> all right, so an extra wrap just to secure it all. We'll do one more. Now, if you notice, I'm moving my thread back and forth as I'm bringing that through the hair. And what I'm doing is I'm literally, it's like flossing your teeth. I'm working the thread through the hair without catching any hair and folding it over. Okay, so now that that's done, I'm going to take my packer and I'm just gonna push this back so that the eye of that hook is exposed again because I kind of went over it a little bit. There we go. Found it. Now I'm going to bring my thread through the hair. And I'm going to find the eye of the hook. And I'm just going to leave that there for a minute. Now, one of the things that I do is I save all of my material bags and I cut them up into these little squares. So what I'm going to do is make a slit in that square halfway through. I'm gonna bring my thread back out and I'm gonna wrap that slit around the thread, fold it over, and that's gonna control all my deer hair and keep it out of the way. I'm gonna pack that back. And now I'm gonna hold it with my hands and now I can make a thread head without catching hair. And now we're just gonna tie that off.
and we made a caterpillar. So what we're going to do with that is now we got to trim it all out and turn it into something. I'm going to move my vise. Is that cool? You got to do what you got to do. All right. Just going to get this stuff out of my way. And you do all your sculpting by hand always, right? Always. Yep. And I'm going to show you exactly how I do all that. So we're going to grab, I'm going to grab a brand new razor blade because there is nothing more dangerous than a dull razor. So I use these little double sided traditional shaving razors. I'm going to hold the fly in my hands and I always start at the belly. You got to think about flies in, or deer hair flies anyway, in basic shapes. Everybody knows what a Dahlberg diver looks like in the end. But if you go at this and start hacking away with that end image in mind, you're not going to get there. So what we need to do is we need to break it down into basics. So we're going to start with a flat belly. I'm going to start at the eye of the hook and I'm just going to trim straight back. Make sure you don't cut your marabou. I'm going to get as close to that hook shank as I can without cutting my thread. And if I did this right, there should be about an eighth of an inch or so of hair on the bottom of the hook shank. Trim it slow. You don't want to remove a ton of hair real fast because don't forget, you can always trim more. You cannot add at this point. Just gonna make sure that that belly is nice and even and as symmetrical as I can eyeball it. The reason that I get kind of OCD over the belly of the fly is it gives us a reference point for trimming out the rest of the fly. So if I've got a perfectly flat bottom, I know that if I need to build, a, you know, if I'm doing a popper, let's say, a popper is essentially a rectangle on a hook that we've rounded off the top. So if you already start with a, a flat cut on the belly, it's easy to build three more sides when you've got a starting point. And I think everybody can see that. So I judge my hook gap. If I can catch my finger on this, I'm not too concerned about catching a fish. I know it's going to happen. I don't get crazy. I mean, there's some people I've seen tie, they got to have, you know, the bottom of their hook has to be down here. Otherwise they're like, oh, I can't catch any fish. That's, that's a load of crap, honestly. If you're missing fish on top water, and I've seen it a hundred times, Large mouth, small mouth, whatever comes up. They open their mouth, they suck the water in, they suck the fly in, and then people set the hook. Well, they missed the fish. Why do they miss the fish? Because the fish hasn't closed its mouth and turned its head yet. So be patient, give it a second, then strip set. And then all of a sudden you're gonna, your hookup ratio is gonna go through the roof. All right, so Dahlberg Diver. It's basically a triangle in the front, meaning we have a slope going this way and we have a slope on the sides. It's pointy up front and then it comes back. They also have a straight up and down collar or a collar that's slightly angled back. This one's gonna be more straight up and down. So what I need to do is I need to know exactly where I'm gonna start my collar when I'm trimming this back. Otherwise I'm gonna end up going too far and then you end up with more you know, more head and, and, and less collar. And that collar is what pushes this fly down. So I'm gonna start by kind of cleaning the eye of the hook a little bit. So now it's kind of flat up front. I'm gonna go right against that eye and I'm gonna start angling up. Now, one of the things that I do is I try to keep my collar and my hook gap around the same size, give or take. And what that does is it makes sure that the hair on top of this fly, number one is dense, 
because the shorter the hair is, the denser your fly is going to be. The other thing is if you've got a ton of hair up on top, deer hair absorbs water. Doesn't matter how tight you pack these things, deer hair is going to absorb water. But what will happen is if you've got a huge collar here and not enough down here to support that, your fly is going to flip over. You will always be top heavy because the top of it will absorb more water than the bottom. Does that make sense? I'm trying yeah, to yeah, that's very helpful. Okay, so I'm going to get my slant on here, my angle. I'm pretty happy with that for right now. I think you can see I've got that kind of sloped up. And now I'm going to go and I'm going to do the same thing on the sides. And I'm just going to start to create that triangular shape. So you're not trying to round it yet. You're just keeping that wedge triangle right now. You got it. Basic shapes. And I'm not even that concerned about it being even yet. I'm just trying to rough out my shape and remove excess material. Fine tuning will happen in a few minutes. Okay, so you can see I've got my basic shape here. It's uneven, doesn't matter yet. Now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna clear the eye of the hook completely. And for anyone who's doing this for the first time, uh, when you whip finish a deer hair bug like this, the thread will almost disappear underneath the thread behind the hook. I mean, you can definitely nick it with your razor, but if you're wondering, was well, he cutting his thread right now? That's why he's not. Yep. It, uh, and I have cut my thread, but when I, when I make my last knot, I really compress that thread down as tight as I can get it. And what it does is it hits the eye of the hook and then naturally pushes down into the deer hair. All right, I'm just trimming out the belly a little tiny bit more. I don't wanna to get too crazy because I don't wanna cut my thread obviously, but I wanted a little bit more space. Okay, so that's, that's a really good gap on there now. You can see pretty good. So now I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna start fine tuning my shape up front. I'm not even worried about my collar yet. This is where I'm gonna start rounding out the top of the fly, the top of the triangle, the nose. So you're not really even curving the blade in your hand. You're just using straight lines to round everything. Yep. Yep, I have more control of it this way, I feel than if I curve the blade. I mean, there's a slight bend, but it is so minute that uh, you wouldn't even really notice unless you were looking for it. Now is when I wanna start evening things up. So I'm gonna look at the bottom of the fly. Now you can see, I think you can see, one side is a little bit off. This side's gotta be trimmed down a little bit more. So now that I know that, I'm just gonna come in with my blade and I'm gonna even that up so that my collar is exact. Almost there up front here, and then we'll start working on our collar. That looks pretty good. I'm pretty even all the way around. I'm happy with that shape. It's gonna fish well. Okay, so I've got my slope up front here. Happy with that. So now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna grab my curved scissors. Now the collar on this is not going to be very tall. It's going to be maybe maybe three sixteenths of an inch above the nose of the fly. So I'm just gonna go all the way around. 
and I'm going to trim that down. And again, we're just rough trimming. So you can see I've got the front curved down and I got all this mess back here. So what I do with that mess, I taper my collars down into the fly, back towards uh, the body of the fly, again, to create that kind of a minnow taper. So I'm gonna take my razor blade and I'm gonna start angling that in. Remember, you've got those tips back there. You don't wanna cut those off. But the less hair you have on the collar, the better off your fly is going to be overall. And this is part of where our deer hair length conversation comes into play. If you notice how much you're cutting off there, I mean, you're really not leaving a ton of hair there, are you? You don't need a lot. No, nope. I mean, this stuff is so buoyant. But that, that's the other thing is, is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to sink deer hair flies. I fish probably 90% of the time, even when I'm fishing top water, I'm using some sort of a, a line that sinks or has some kind of a sink rate to it. Very rarely do I fish floating lines. Um, the only real exception, I guess, would be if I was carp fishing, but I wouldn't be using this kind of a fly. <laughs> if you get a carp to eat one of those, please let us know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> I've had to meet like uh, deer hair grasshoppers and, uh, you know, stuff like that before. But not a big fly like this. Although I have had them chase streamers down and eat streamers before. I love carp fishing. Yeah, me too. It's a blast. Okay, so you can see here, I've got a taper going down all the way around. So I've got, it basically matches the, the upfront slope. So I've got the slope here going towards the eye of the hook. Now I've got a slope in the back going down towards the bend of the hook. So what I'm gonna do now is just make sure that that's all even and just kind of fine tune it a little bit. Again, less hair on the hook, the better off you're gonna be, especially on this backside. So Taller is always going to absorb water more than everything else. So you when you first, it. when you did your first cut with your curved scissors, then you were almost using that as a guide for cutting back on the rest of the, the collar. Yep. Cool. Yep. The, the curved scissors basically gave me a guideline for the very front of my collar. Now I'm just going through and I'm making sure that that collar is even all the way around. Symmetry or, or close to symmetry is pretty important in flies. I mean, it's, it's really important in lore building. It's important in everything. Um, if you have more material one side of the fly than the other or uh, whatever it is that you're making, you're always going to have imbalances in your swim which sometimes that's desirable. But if that is desirable, then you wanna do that in a controlled manner. You wanna know exactly what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. Generally speaking, a fly that is symmetrical is the goal because you know exactly what a fly that's symmetrical is gonna do in the water. And you can make these bounce around erratic and whatever. I mean, the biggest thing that I see fly anglers not do is they're uh, it's like they're afraid to use their rod tip to impart action on a fly i mean watch a bass show on a saturday morning sometime and and look what those guys are doing with with the rods you know those lures don't necessarily do everything they want them to do on their own and nor will a fly it's our job as an angler to give these things life so that means yeah you can strip it in but strip it in, jerk the rod tip around, move it up, move it down, have fun with it and give it life, make it do crazy stuff and you will be rewarded. It's almost a guarantee. That's a great point. Just trimming down a little bit more. I got a little bit more hair on top of here than I want. Again, I fish this on an intermediate line subsurface and then I let it 
ride back up to the surface and then I dive it down and I get almost a almost a jigging action out of a fly like this. When when do most your eats come on that pause and rise? Yeah, a lot of the time it's it's on the pause. Sometimes, you know, you you strip it in real fast and it these things move all over the place. They almost have um because of that that collar up front, you know, you've got this hydrodynamic push. So you've got this fly wants to go down because of the slope. And then this is pushing straight against it. So it's forcing it to kind of go side to side. So you get this crankbait almost like action out of it on a continuous strip. They kind of move side to side and pretty erratic. Um, so that that tends to bring them in. And then the pause is usually where you get clobbered. It's a really cool fly. Uh, I noticed you uh, you dyed your tails. How do you like to color your tails? So I use a product called uh, Dynaflow, which is a, uh, it's made by Jacquard. And what it is, is a silk paint. Um, so I use that with a brush. They're little liquid jars. And I just paint them on. You let it air dry and then you iron them for a few minutes and uh, the color is permanent. You can use all sorts of things though. You can use fabric markers. You can use fabric dyes. Um, there's this stuff called, uh, it's called one shot or color shot or something. It's like a, uh, an aerosol can. It's a fabric paint. Um, yeah, but that, that jacquard I like a lot because um, it's really light. It doesn't add any weight to the material where a lot of fabric paints are latexy. So you kind of, you stiffen up the material a little bit if you use too much of it. The Dynaflow, you can't use too much of it. It doesn't, it doesn't stiffen at all. So it keeps the material nice and loose and it's permanently dyed. So I've been using that since I started making these things like eight or nine years ago. All right. So here is my finished shape. You see from the front and then from the side, we've got, I'll bring up a little closer. So you've got this nice slope here, solid collar up front. And then again, a nice slope here, removing all that excess material. And then you've got your tips tapered over top of your marabou. We can take that little piece of foam off now. Hopefully I won't hook myself. <laughs> but you can see how freely that tail wiggles around and moves. When it gets wet, these the the creature bodies have a little bit of weight to them because they do absorb a lot of water but when they absorb that water they also become very very fluid in the water um so now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to put even though all my color is on top it doesn't really make a difference i mean i could have i could have side stacked it so that it literally looked like you know half the belly was on one side and, and you could definitely do that um and i do do that I just didn't do it for this one because that complicates everything drastically. So we needed this to stay fairly simple today, I think. So I'm just using an eye from uh, my buddy Matt over at Dead Neat Customs. He makes some crazy, crazy, crazy. Matt has customs. awesome eyes, agreed. Oh, man, yeah, his eyes are wild. So I'm just gonna put this right on the belly of the fly. And you can see that little gill slit that we made, that little red. So now it literally will look like this fly is an injured bait fish on the surface doing its thing. Now, one of the things that I like to do with these bugs, again, it's, it's a durability thing. Um, I use uh, Loon Soft Head and I will coat the belly of the fly and then I coat the, the diving face and the collar just to stiffen it up. And then that's it. And then you it's go behind you the collar or no? Nope, nope. I like, see, so I like bass bugs to absorb water. I'm one of those weirdos with this stuff where I want them to sink. I really, I really like fishing them subsurface. So I'll even go as far as when I know I'm gonna be fishing a fly like this for a day, I will take it and I will soak it in water for half an hour before I even fish it to make sure that the water has absorbed evenly throughout the hair. And then I just kind of squeeze it 
and all the excess water comes out and then I fish it. And then I can get a fly that lays at rest low in the surface film and I can make it dive underneath a whole hell of a lot easier with a little bit of uh, water log to it. Just picturing so, where a frog sits in the water column, that makes a ton of sense, just right in the film. Yeah, the only thing you ever see on a frog when you're, when you're out there is the eyes. Um, and if you, if you look in my book, the way that I tie my frog leg sliders, they're heavily weighted in the back. So literally they sit, you know, if this is the water surface, they sit kind of like this. So the legs are draped way down and it's just the eyes and the nose that are up above the surface. I try to make things as natural and realistic as possible. I mean, they know what they're eating. So why wouldn't we give them what they know? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we have a little pond out back here that, you know, they're pretty used to the angle of retrieve that we hit with them when we cast out here and, you know, picture we throw in everything on them. Um, and the fly that they eat almost without fail is a diver, a frog diver, like just the way it sits in the water, the way it slurps and gulps, there's really nothing else that moves like it. No, and that's the cool thing about deer hair is it, it really, I mean, there are much easier ways, obviously, to tie surface flies. You know, you can use foam, you can use stuff like that. Um, but you cannot, I don't care what the material is, other than deer hair, you cannot substitute natural deer hair the noise and the way that it works in the water. I mean, the noise that a deer hair diver or a deer hair popper makes in the water is so unique. Foam doesn't do it. Um, it it's this really deep, I don't know. I don't even know how to describe it. You just have to go out and experience it, you know, but it's a totally different sound. It's a totally different motion. Um, I don't know, the, the water push, everything about deer hair is just- Like a me, popping gurgle as opposed to like a foam slap. I don't, I, I'm with you. It's challenging to describe. Yeah, that's a great description. Yeah, it's hard to, hard to supplement deer hair. Yeah, well, thank you for taking a few minutes and showing us. This is a really cool pattern. What, what do you call this one? Uh, it's just an articulated diver. It's, you know, just, uh, like I said, a take off of Larry Dahlberg's uh, Dahlberg diver and, uh, it's just an articulated version. It's well, it's fun. awesome. Yeah, it's fishy, man. It catches. Yeah, well, hey, thank you, Pat. Is uh, First off, thank you for coming on here and doing this. Uh, I know there's a ton of people who, who've seen your work and, and are kind of don't really know where to start. So getting to see, you know, some of the techniques you use and answering, you know, bearing with some of the silly questions I'm asking, you know, I, a lot of us have either figured stuff out by doing it the wrong way first and then getting there or you know if we were fortunate we got to read or see some really you know of your stuff um to learn and, and anyway thank you very much uh this has been cool um hopefully we can have you back on to do something else another time uh, yeah, absolutely, man. is, is there fun. anything sorry i didn't mean to cut you off what was that well i said no i i appreciate you having me man this was fun Agreed. Uh, is there anything that we didn't touch on that you feel like you want to add or anything before we let you run? I mean, the thing with, with any fly tying is there's no, don't get hung up with the right and wrong and the rules and, and, you know, you can't do this. You can't do that. It, it's all, it's all make believe BS go out and have fun and create, and enjoy and go out and have an experience and then come back to your vice and say, this is what I need to do now. This is how I'm going to solve that problem and create that problem. And don't be afraid to play. You know, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. And definitely don't get caught up in all the social media craziness with fly fishing and fly tying. <laughs> they're, they're all... I don't know. Everybody's cooped up too much, I think. So just enjoy it. Have fun and uh, just go out and catch fish. Thank you, Pat. I really appreciate yeah. having you on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.